Good morning. Happy Monday, everyone. Praise God. He's awakened us to this opportunity to walk with him in faith and to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we might have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with him and walk worthily before him and bring glory to his name by our obedience. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning humbly declaring that you are our God, that you've chosen us as your children, and that you've provided salvation for us through the death, burial, raising from the dead, and ascension to your right hand of your Son, Jesus Christ. We believe it, Father. We trust in it, Father, and we walk in it, knowing that you've sent your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us on the path that we should take. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for the extreme love that you show toward us. Help us, Father, to know your will and your way and to seek your face in all that we do so that we might walk worthily before you and bring glory to your name. In Jesus Christ's name, Father, I ask that this lesson bless all who hear it and encourage them and instruct them and teach them the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So this morning, we're starting a new quarter. We're now in the fall quarter of 2023. Our daily devotional this morning is titled The Noahic Covenant. It's from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, <clears throat> verses 8 through 17. And it reads And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth <clears throat> and I will establish my covenant with you neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall they there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For perpetual generations I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. <clears throat> and the bow shall be in the cloud and, it will, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. <clears throat> God made a promise to Noah, a covenant, that he would no longer or never again destroy the earth by water, by flooding. God was repentant for the death and destruction that he caused by the flood. God is a loving God. He doesn't want to destroy. But man 
insists on turning away from God and going his own way. So he creates his own destruction by his disobedience. <clears throat> okay, like I said, we're in the fall quarter. Here's the introduction. Lessons 1 through 7 are a study of early Jewish history. Genesis chapters 12 through 50. Beginning with the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then walking through the life of Joseph. The expositions were written by Rebecca Basedo Hill. Dr. Hill has taught at the Pentecostal Theological Seminary since 2013. She has also served as an adjutant instructor at Southern Southeastern University and Regent University. Rebecca and her husband Mark Hill co-pastor young adults at Woodward Church of God in Athens, Tennessee. They have one daughter, Madeline. Dr. Hill earned her doctorate degree from the University of South Africa. Lessons 8 and 13 concern the Bible and today's issues. The topics addressed are the sanctity of human life, pornography, homosexuality, messages of media, the environment, and using technology wisely. <clears throat> the expositions were written by Richard Keith, Reverend Witt, R Richard Keith Witt. Reverend Witt has earned degrees from Lee University and the Church of God Theological Seminary and has done doctoral work at the University of Nottingham, England. An ordained bishop in the Church of God, Keith served his denomination as a pastor for 23 years. He has taught courses for the Church of God Theological Seminary and the Lee University Division of Adult Learning. <clears throat> Okay, lesson number one, by covenant, Abraham became the first Jew. Central truth is that God still calls people to enter into covenant with him. The focus is to recognize and believe that God is a faithful covenant keeper. The evangelism emphasis is that the church should proclaim God's invitation to all people to participate in the new covenant. And the golden text says, Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's from Genesis 15, 6. <clears throat> okay, our introduction. What is the foundation of God's plan for salvation? The foundation is God's covenant and his faithfulness in fulfilling the covenant. Therefore, the biblical idea of covenant is one of the most significant things in the Bible. In addition to being the foundation for God's plan of salvation, the covenant shows God's desire to have a personal relationship with humanity. As Christians, though, Christ through sight, as Christians, through Christ's sacrificial death, God has established a new covenant with us. See Matthew 26, 28 and Hebrews 8, verses 16 through 13. Under this new covenant, our sins are forgiven and we are born again. However, as we enter into this new covenant, we are required to walk daily in faithful relationship with God. To illustrate what it means to live in a covenantal relationship with God, this week's lesson focuses on the story of Abraham. Before we turn to Abraham's story, let us first consider the meaning of the word covenant. A covenant is not the same as a modern day contract. <clears throat> a contract is a business transaction agreement made between two or more individuals. The contract is formalized when people who may be friends, mere acquaintances, or even strangers exchange goods, services, and or money with each other. 
The primary focus of the contract is the transaction of assets between parties. A covenant, however, is required from people who are not naturally, naturally related desire to have an intimate relationship. Accordingly, a covenant guides unions with a relational focus. The central expression of the biblical covenant is heard in the phrase, I will be your God, and you will be my people. When human beings sinned, the covenant provided the way for God to restore relationship with them. Thus, God alone initiates a covenant. In this covenant, God's covenant is always called <clears throat> my covenant. Uh, example, Genesis 19.5, indicating his covenant is not negotiated between equal parties. It begins with a promise from God. As a result, the individual is expected to demonstrate exclusive loyalty to God. So, so it was with God's covenant with Abraham. In making a covenant with Abraham, God promised to make him into a great nation, to bless him, to make his name great, to bless those who blessed him, to curse those who cursed him, and to bless the families of the earth through him. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. In return, Abraham was required to leave his native country and follow God faithfully. God's covenant with Abraham is developed steadily in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. <clears throat> All right, section one, called of God, covenant instituted. Genesis chapter 12, verses one through five, and it says, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. <clears throat> the commentary says, The story of Abraham begins with his genealogy and an introduction to characters and relationships that become significant in the subsequent stories concerning him. See Genesis 11, verses 27 through 32. We see the detail that Abraham we see the detail that Abraham was married to Sarah, who was barren. That's from verse 30. Sarah's barrenness comes into focus in those chapters that develop God's covenant with Abraham. The call of Abraham begins with a word from God that requires Abraham to leave his country, his family, and all other familiar connections to go to a, law, a, a land God will show him. That's from Genesis 12, 1. God does not specify Abraham's destination or even identify his direction. Nevertheless, the call demands Abraham to separate from all familiar ties and to be led by God every step of the way. In this separation, what Abraham breaks from the past and the word God now speaks concerns the future. The requirement to leave his country and father's household is followed by the promises of God's covenant with Abraham. God promises to bless him in verse 2, to assign him a great nation, verse 2, to protect him, verse 3, and to make him a blessing to all humanity, in verse 3. <clears throat> Not knowing where he is headed, Abraham, at 75 years old, 
obeys the call of God, takes his family, and departs from his country in faith. As we hear God promising to make Abraham a great nation, we must not forget Sarah is barren. Furthermore, we will soon learn Sarah is old and well past the age of bearing children. Genesis, Genesis 17, 17. Sarah's barrenness signifies hopelessness, the end of a family's line, and thereby complicates God's announcement of the future. God's creative word for the future emerges from Sarah's barrenness. Therefore, Abraham's departure is an act of faith, where he goes out to claim a future from a descendant who has not yet been conceived. <clears throat> okay, section 1b, covenant instituted. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a co covenant with Abraham, saying, or Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. <clears throat> Commentary says, Chapter 15 opens with a divine word from God to Abraham. Do not fear. Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Why would Abraham be fearful? As we recall, God appeared to Abraham and promised to make him a great nation. In Genesis 12, 2, to become a mighty nation required Abraham to have an heir. However, Abraham and Sarah were still childless. Sarah's persistent barrenness threatened the future of their family line and invalidated God's promise to Abraham. Therefore, God's assurance of a future and protection was not met with enthusiastic submission, but with a question of protest that pointed to Abraham's doubts about God's promises. <clears throat> How could Abraham receive an exceedingly great reward when Sarah continued to be barren and the heir to his household was the Elizazer, the servant of his household. God did not rebuke Abraham for questioning the divine word, but rather God engaged in dialogue to reassure Abraham that his own son, not Elizazer, would be his heir. God's word of reassurance was followed by a sign. God invited Abraham to look at the multitude of stars in the sky. The point was made clear. Abraham's descendants 
would be innumerable as the stars in the night sky. What was Abraham's response to God's word? He believed. This is the first time the verb believe appears in scripture. And its appearance here teaches us what it means to have faith in God. To believe God's promise is to be absolutely convinced God's word concerning the future will become a reality. Therefore, Abraham was convinced he would have a son. Consequently, Abraham was counted as righteous because he believed in God. In the rest of the chapter, God dramatically calls the covenant with Abraham. Oh, in the rest of the chapter, God dramatically seals the covenant with Abraham. First, God identifies himself to Abraham, saying, I am the Lord, Yahweh, <clears throat> who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. This is the first time in scripture that God introduces himself as I am the Lord. This introduction will be heard later in Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 verse 6, chapter 7, verse 5, and 17, and chapter 10, verse 2. Furthermore, the language of God bringing Abraham out of a country is similar to God bringing Israel out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, God alone is responsible for Abraham's exodus from Ur of the Chaldeans and the benefit of of God bringing him out of Ur is his salvation and faith in God. <clears throat> Second, a ritual act of sacrifice, perhaps a blood oath, is performed that signals the binding of Abraham to God in covenant. Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. Third, in the form of a dream, God reaffirms his promise to Abraham by showing him the future of his descendants. God reveals the oppression his descendants will experience in Egypt and their exodus from Egypt. However, God tells Abraham that he will not witness these events, but he can be certain they will happen. Abraham will not only die before these events, but he will not be around to see his innumerable descendants. No wonder the author of Hebrews wrote, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11:13. Following the dream, God consumed the sacrifice with fire and made a covenant with Abraham by indicating the physical boundaries of Abraham's inheritance of land. Genesis 15 verses 17 through 21. In chapter 15, God's covenant was a promise to Abraham, Abraham just needed to believe. And there's an insert here titled, Bound by a Promise. It says, the biblical idea of covenant is closely associated with our understanding of marriage. The union of marriage indicates two people deliberately choose to enter into a personal relationship that is bound by the promises of steadfast love, absolute faithfulness, and dedicated devotion. We are all bound by a promise. <clears throat> God has bound himself to us by his promise. His promise that the blood of Jesus Christ has paid for our sins if we will just believe and confess him as our Lord and Savior. 
what a beautiful work of redemption God has performed on our behalf. A very creative act of love that nothing can come against to destroy. This covenant promise that we will be saved, that we will receive salvation, that we will be restored to relationship with God through the death of His Son on the cross that paid for our sin, the shedding of innocent blood on our behalf restores us unto everlasting relationship with God. What a wonderful thing to receive. I pray you receive it with earnestness that you take seriously the relationship God is offering you. Take advantage of it. Draw close to Him. Know Him in a more intimate way and be restored and be, 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 be transformed into the image of his son. I thank you for your time this morning. I, I pray that this lesson encourages you to seek a closer relationship with the Father. And I pray that the day that you have today is full of God's blessings. Thank you.